The text this morning is Psalm 147. These are the words of God. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem, he gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his understanding is infinite. The Lord lifteth up the meek, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, and those that hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders, and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word, and melteth them. He causeth the wind to blow, and the waters flow. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for this passage, this psalm, this song. I pray that your spirit would be active and at work in our midst this morning, applying this word to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The message today is about God, the God of the high and the low. On the one hand, we know that God is far above us, higher than the highest heaven, but we also have to confess that he is beneath our feet, supporting us in every conceivable way. God is above us, God is beneath us, God is on either side of us, God is in front, and God is behind. He is the God of the macrocosm, but he's also an infinitely skilled miniaturist, folding enormous libraries of information into trillions of cells, and that is in just one body. Each human body here has trillions of cells, and each one of them has a library of coded information that God has inscribed there. He is the God of general natural revelation, the God of galaxies and nebulae, and he is the God who also reveals himself in the propositions of human language in nouns and verbs. God is the God of the great and God of the small. God is the God of the galaxies and the God of subatomic particles. God dwells in eternity. He lives in the highest heaven, but he also dwells with the lowly and humble, as we're taught in Isaiah 57, 15. God is great and mighty above the highest heaven, and where does he dwell? He dwells in the hearts of the lowly. These are all contrasts for us, but they are not contrasts for him. These are contrasts for us, but not for him. So uh, a galaxy for him is just as small as a, an atom, right? His under, we're, we're told here his understanding is infinite. So when, when I talk about God being a miniaturist, a skilled miniaturist, and I'm, I'm talking about things that are small to us or are microscopic to us, but everything is microscopic to him. He's a miniaturist in everything. The cosmos is tiny. God's understanding is, in fact, infinite. So let's consider this psalm verse by verse, and then we're going to drill down into a few uh, particular aspects about it. The one thing that we can say about praising the God of heaven is that such praise is fitting. It's comely. It's, it's appropriate. That's verse 1. It's appropriate for people like us to praise God for the sorts of things that he does. It's appropriate. It's fitting. It's comely. He builds up the city where he has set his name, and he does this by gathering in the riffraff. He gathers up the outcasts of Israel. This is how God builds his kingdom. He gathers up those who are despised by the world. He gathers up those who are not much in the eyes of the world, the, the stately ones, the lordly ones. So imagine, if you will, 
uh, the rattiest of trailer parks that you can imagine. There's some very nice ones, but there are some ratty ones also. Imagine a cross between a really ratty trailer park, trailer park and a leper colony, and that's where God gathers up his recruits. That's where God goes to get sinners who are dirty enough to be forgiven. Why? Well, because they know that they're dirty. They know that they've got a problem. This, this is why Jesus said that prostitutes and tax collectors were going to make it into the kingdom before the theologians. The theologians clean up real nice. The theologians look good. The theologians know how to tie a necktie. But the, the people who are losers, well, that's where God recruits. The, ki the, the kingdom of heaven is going to be open to them before it is open to those who think they have their act together. So what God does is he establishes his kingdom by gathering in the outcasts, by gathering in the riffraff. That's verse 2. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. Verse 3. Remember, he is a miniaturist. Your wounds, which are big to you, are not too small for him to tend to. Uh, your bro broken heart, which is large to you, is not too small for him to address. He binds up the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted. He also, he, but he's also the God of the cosmos, verse 4. He knows how many stars there are, and he names each one. It was sort of quaint. Looking at, old, uh, looking at old commentators who talked about how the, the, the fact that there were hundreds of thousands of stars, and we now know that there are billions of galaxies. With, uh, and each galaxy contains billions of stars, and God has a name for each one of them. Not only does he have a name for each one, but he knows the position and velocity of every atom in every one of those stars. He is the, he is the God of all. He, he, he takes in the big picture, and he knows the small picture. His understanding, verse 5, he is truly great. His understanding is genuinely infinite. There is no limit to it. He lifts up the meek and he throws down the wicked, verse 6. So we would, our temptation would be to think that if God is that great, he can only be that great at a distance. He can only be that great by backing up and looking at the whole thing. And he has the big picture, of course, because he's God. But no, he, he comes down and intervenes. He lifts up the meek. Remember, he, he uh, healed the brokenhearted. He already bound up the wounds of t insignificant, tiny creatures like us. And he comes down and he takes sides. He lifts up the meek and he throws down the wicked. He throws down the mighty from their seats, as our Lord's mother put it. So that's verse 6. So it's appropriate for us to sing to him, to sing praises to him, to play the harp for him. Verse 7. We should, we might say, well, our praise doesn't amount to much, but it's big to us and we, we should overflow with praise toward him. That It's comely, it's fitting, it's good. Verse 7, he fills the sky with clouds and he gives rain to the earth. Verse 8, he fills, he, God, God has given us a world, world with a built-in irrigation system. These, as Watts put it, these cisterns in the sky that are portable, they move around, they move around and they, and they, Give you rain, give rain on, on, on the earth so that the earth may produce food. Have you ever, you should think about how weird that is. Where does, where does our food come from? It comes from the dirt. And God, so water comes down from the sky and it falls on the dirt and then the dirt produces fruit, a food for us to eat. And then imagine being a, a 20 year old Israelite 30 years into the sojourn in the wilderness. They were there for 40 years. This 20-year-old was born 10 years in, and it's 10 years to go before we, uh, the Israelites invade Canaan. And he's in a discussion with his folks one day, and he discovers that they think that in other countries, the food comes out of the ground instead of coming down out of the sky. Because his entire life, food has always fallen from the sky. That's his entire lived experience. Well, both of them are equally weird. All right. Food coming out of the sky is not in our experience, but food coming out of the ground was not in theirs. All right. God gives, God bestows food on us. He gives us food. Not only does he give us food, verse 8, he feeds all the beasts of the field. He feeds the young ravens as they cry, verse 9. Ravens are, not, are an unclean bird and God feeds, feeds them. The young ravens are an unclean bird and God feeds them. The beasts of the field are fed by him, verse 9. He's not impressed by horsepower, and he's not impressed by manpower either, verse 10, which is probably a reference to cavalry and infantry. He's not, it's, it's probably a military reference. God is not awed by our mounted horse, 
and he and uh, uh, horsepower. He's not uh, awed by our mounted military might, and he's not awed by our marching military might. When people fear him, the Lord is pleased with that. When people fear him, the Lord is pleased. We're going to circle back around and focus on that a little bit later. He is pleased with those who look to him for mercy. Verse 11. Again, praise from Jerusalem and Zion is fitting. We learned at the beginning of the psalm that praise is comely. Here, praise is fitting. Verse 12. God has built up her defenses and given them lots of blessed children. Verse 13. Children are a blessing. Children are a resource. Because uh, progressives and leftists don't know how to feed people, right? This is one, one of the reasons we know Jesus wasn't a socialist, is he could feed people. You may think about that, two in the morning. Oh. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus knew how to supply the needs of the people. He fed the multitudes. And we think we can't. In long experience, we realize that on our own strength and our own devices, we can't. And so we think, well, the problem is all these people who eat too much. And so we start thinking of people as, as consumers. How many times have you heard you referred to as consumers? How many consumers are there uh, walking around eating up resources? But you were born into the world with one mouth and two hands, and under the blessing of God, you're supposed to produce twice as much as you consume. And if you are producing twice as much as you consume, there's no such thing as overpopulation. It says in Proverbs that through lack of subjects, a prince is ruined. Through lack of subjects, a prince is ruined. And when you see a people with a declining, or in our case, the West, in terms of Western culture, a plummeting birth rate, you are looking at a people who have lost their God. They have lost their faith, they have lost their God, they have lost their way. And because they've lost their way, they know that they can't feed everybody. They can't, they, they can't meet anybody's needs. But, but under the blessing of God, what do we have? God builds up your defenses and gives them lots, verse 13, lots of blessed children. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And I, I should add here, by the grace of God, and this is a wonderful blessing for our community, our, um, we re the elders recently received a report on the demographics of our community here. And in, in our community, the number of 18-year-olds uh, and under is over 40%. Over 40% of our number are 18 years old and under. That's America in 1958. It, we're, not, we're not this upside down pyramid where the, the uh, boomer generation is aging out and you've got this teetery thing with the younger kids having to, that's not what's happening here. And, and what, what, is, what is happening here? Well, it's a testimony that God is restoring our faith in the future and you cannot have faith in the future without faith in God. All right, if, if uh, it says in Ephesians that the unbelievers are without God and without hope in the world. If you don't know God, the future is scary. Or the future is terrifying if you don't know God. But God holds the future in the palm of his hand. All of it. Everything is, everything is settled. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. And so consequently, having faith in a God like that, and having faith in his word where he tells us that through lack of subjects a prince is ruined, and children are a blessing from the Lord. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. That is, and notice the quiver is full of them. It's, that's a weapon of war. It's, it's not, that's not the blessing of the patter of little feet around the house, although that is a blessing in itself, but that's not what, this, what it's talking about. That man is blessed when his sons are standing with him behind his back at a city council meeting on his side. All right, that's, that's the blessing. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of such arrows. So he gives peace along the border, verse 14, and he bestows abundant crops. Peace along the border, bestowing abundant crops. The world does not run on impersonal natural law, but rather God sends forth his commandment, which runs along swiftly, verse 15. The world does not run on impersonal natural law. God governs. God, and his, his government of the world is up close and personal. Everything happens according to his word. Notice God sends forth his commandment, which runs along swiftly. He gives us snow, which means you shouldn't complain about it. All right? Even if you took your plow off your truck like I just did. 
He gives us snow. He gives us rime. He gives us hoarfrost. Verse 16. These, these are blessings from God. This is part of his goodness to us. He scatters ice and he brings in the freezing cold. Verse 17. And then, after giving the ice, he melts the ice. Verse 18, that too is a gift from God. He grants the Chinook, and everything melts. There's nothing quite like a huge snowstorm, and then stepping outside at night, having a warm spring breeze blow in, and everything melts. It's, it's, it's a, quite an experience. God does that. God sends the snow, he sends the ice, he sends the warmth, he sends everything. He reveals his laws to Jacob, his commandments to Israel. Verse 19. And he has not dealt in this fashion with any other nation. This is how he dealt with the Jews in the Old Testament. Neither have the other nations known his judgments. Under the New Covenant we do. But in the Old Testament there was a different setup. The chosen people, the Jews were the chosen people. But this, does not, this did not mean that the Jews were the favorite people. It means they, they were the chosen people. It's like a, an instructor... Uh, with a classroom uh, full of students, and he calls on one of the students to come up to the board and do a problem. And that student comes up to the front of the class. That student is the chosen pupil. And if he gets the problem right, he's the class hero. Right? He, good job, you, you escaped, you didn't, you didn't disgrace yourself. But if he crashes and burns, he crashes and burns in front of the whole class. Right? What, that's what happens. That's what happens to the chosen people. The chosen people were called up before uh, the front of the class, and God, when they walked with the Lord and he blessed them, all the nations of men looked at that and said, oh, this is how God deals with men. And then when they disobeyed his word and he visited them with severe chastisements, all the class went, whoa, whoa. That, that, that's what happens when you disregard, disregard God and his word. And then the psalm concludes with another, praise ye the Lord, verse 20. So let's consider a few aspects of this. The first and the last word in this psalm is the same word, which is hallelujah. Hallelujah is praise Yah, praise Yahweh, praise Jehovah. So the, word, the psalm begins with hallelujah, and the psalm ends with hallelujah. Each hallelujah should be thought of by you as a piece of bread, and one goes on the top and the other one goes on the bottom. But in some circles, Christians want to sing hallelujah over and over as though it were a Hindu mantra. A Hindu mantra is where you say the same word like om. It's a, it's a meditative word that you say over and over and over. And you say it until your brain trips off the line and you achieve enlightenment. The whole idea is to empty your mind and your soul and your heart of content. You, uh, content, according to them, would be a Western way of thinking. You just empty it out, empty it out, empty it out. And tragically, some Christians worship God that way. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Uh, and you're expecting at some point a voice from heaven to say, what? <laughs> you, we have your, you have our attention. What are you talking about? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What are you saying? What are you saying? Well, in biblical terms, uh, the... In biblical terms, praising God that way is like making a bread sandwich. It's like having a piece of bread and then three pieces of bread, no mayo, and then another piece of bread. That's not how you make a sandwich. That's not how it's supposed to go. Biblically, this psalm models what we want. And this, this psalm gives us a biblical Dagwood. All right? A Dagwood, it's a, well... There's a cartoon strip, Blondie. Dagwood's the husband. He used to build these sandwiches. Piece of bread, piece of bread, and then lots and lots in between. This is a biblical Dagwood. And we model it on this psalm. Here's the bread, then the salami, then the ham, then the cheese, then the onions, then the prosciutto, then a different kind of cheese, then another piece of bread. And that's just a small one. So what you want to do is fill the sandwich with content. There's substance in the middle. The bread frames the praise, but the actual praise is found in the content of what we say. And if you look carefully at this psalm, you'll see all kinds of different content. You'll, you, you, see, you see the cheese and the ham, the prosciutto, you see all these different things. How many times does he change the subject? But it's not changing the subject. Why is it not changing the subject? Because that's a sandwich. Right? You wanna, when you walk up to the table and that sandwich is there, you, no one says... Why did you change the subject? It's all one subject. It's a complicated subject, but it's all one sandwich. It all goes together. And so 
if we, if we were, if we had our wits about us, if we knew what we were doing, we would be thanking God still for God's intervention, his mighty works that he displayed in the destruction of the Spanish Armada. Right? And you might say, what was the Spanish Armada? Well, it's when the Catholic power Spain attacked England and God intervened with a fierce storm that destroyed the Spanish fleet. It was just, it was a, it was really Old Testament. <laughs> right out of the Old Testament. And you say, we, you should have told that to your children and your children's children. And, your, and you, we should have been talking about that. That should have been one of the things that, that goes in the sandwich. And the same thing is true of our nation. There are many marvelous works of God that we've just neglected because we want to, we've resorted in our folly, we've resorted to our bread sandwiches. We just say, praise God. Praise God. For what, actually? Well, I don't want to get too specific because I don't want to make claims about, what, uh, about history. And I don't, you, you must. You must thank, when you thank God for your food, you do this on, on pr a practical daily level, don't you? When you're thanking God for your lunch today, you sit down with your family and you, you bow your heads and you thank God uh, for the food. Suppose you had a precocious 12-year-old boy who said, Father, how do, we, how do we know that God's not just fattening, fattening us up for the slaughter? Why do we thank him for this? Well, you thank him because you are trusting him that this was an, interve an intervention on your behalf. This was a provision for you, and you're taking it as a good thing. We can zoom out a little bit further and do the same thing with political events and battles and historical events. We can and should. You might say, but I, I don't have enough knowledge about these things to do this, well, the response to that is we ought to get that knowledge. You, you might say, I don't have enough ham to make a sandwich. Well, get some. Get some ham. Our obligation is to do this and praise God with content. So go, if you don't have enough ham, go get some ham. So look carefully at this psalm. You're going to see all sorts of uh, varying kinds of content. Also, one of the perennial temptations that theologians have is that of thinking that nece the necessary distinctions that they have to make are distinctions that somehow create a separation or a division. For example, we may distinguish the love and justice of God, but these two attributes are not separated in him. In him, we, we affirm the doctrine of God's simplicity. These things, which we say, well, the love of God does this, and the Bible speaks to us this way, so we may, we certainly may. But God is, is bending to our capacity. The justice of God can be described this way, the love of God this way, the kindness of God that way. Um, but if you take all the attributes of God, like light, all the different light, col colors of light in the spectrum, and you combine them all, what you have is white, white light. That's holiness. The holiness of God is the sum total of everything that God is, everything that God has. All of his attributes taken together are holy, holy, holy. And so these distinctions don't mean that we have uh, God operating in his kindness over here and God operating in his justice over there. We can distinct with, uh, this is an easy thing for us to, to conceptualize. Think of it this way. A small child can distinguish height and breadth and depth, it's easy to distinguish them. But it's impossible to separate them. If you remove the height of this pulpit, you do not have a very, very flat pulpit. You have no pulpit. If you just, just zero out one attribute, just the height, you don't have a flat pulpit. If you zero out the depth, you don't have a narrow pulpit. You, they're in, these, these distinct attributes, height, breadth, and depth, are inseparable. So why does that what does that have to do with this psalm? The reason for addressing this is that theologians are fond of distinguishing natural revelation and special revelation. As though God, and, and the folly in this, is where they, they start thinking these two kinds of revelation lead to two different gods. It's like saying, it's, if one of you teenagers said, well, my mother texts me certain things she wants me to do when I get home from school, and then... When I got home from school, there was a post-it note on the fridge that had an extra chore. And I'm talking to this uh, teen, and he says, well, I, actually, I have two moms. I have a texting mom, and I have a post-it note mom. And you'd say, no, you have one mom and two different ways of communicating. 
There's two ways of getting a word to you, but it's one mom. And there are people who think that natural revelation leads to one God and special revelation leads us to another God. No, it's all the living God. It's all one God. It's the triune God of Scripture. God creates everything, gives us everything through the created order. He speaks to us through the created order. And he also speaks to us with nouns and verbs and propositions. He, it, but it's all, it, it all goes back up to the one true God. So we distinguish natural revelation and special revelation, and it's good that we do, but we have to look at the two together. In this, uh, in this psalm, both of them are there together in the sandwich. He speaks through the stars. He speaks through agriculture. He speaks through his providential care of ravens, and he's shouting whenever he gives us rhyme. But woven through the whole thing, he is also the one whose commandments run swiftly in the natural order, verse 15, and he reveals his laws and his commandments to Israel as well. It's all part of what we receive. We receive God's special revelation and we receive his general revelation because God is talking to us all the time in everything. Uh, Cornelius Van Til said that if there was a place on your radio, if, unf if fallen man had a radio and he could turn the dial and there was one place on the dial where we weren't hearing from God, we would all have our dial set to that one place. We, would, we want God to be silent. We want God to be at a distance. But he isn't. He's shouting at us in every blade of grass, in every raindrop, in every leaf, on every tree, every breeze that hits you in the face, everything. It's, God's talking to you. You live in a personal world, not in an impersonal one. So, <coughs> too many Christians assume that this world is just the kind of impersonal place that Voltaire thought it was, only we believe that God is at the top, along with some angels, way at a distance, and we are down here at the bottom with our souls tucked away underneath the sternum. Everything else we think is just atoms banging around. Or we are more de we're more deistic than materialistic, and we think it's a cold, impersonal clock that God wound up at the creation and then walked away. No, we don't believe in a clock following a pre-programmed routine. The world is not like this at all. Christ is the one who holds all things together, not gravity. Gravity is not something that holds things together. Gravity is the name we give to conceal our helplessness. We don't know why things stick together. So we give them names, and we think that giving a name is the same thing as giving an explanation. It's not an explanation at all. Why do you stick to the sidewalk when you walk? Because God is kind. You wouldn't be able to get there if you, you know, he wants you to get there. So he lets you stick to the sidewalk. I remember years ago in a physics class, the atom, neutrons have no charge, and protons have, all have a positive charge. If you push two, uh, the positive end of two magnets together, they repel. So the nucleus of an atom has ne neutrons with no charge, and then a bunch of protons, all of them positively charged, and they're all clustered together in this nucleus. It's, they're all stuck together. Why do these positively charged protons stick together? Well, our instructor said, helpfully, we call this the strong force. Oh. <laughs> you're just describing. You're not explaining. All right, we, we are Christians, and we believe that God created the universe and that it's the word of God continu continuously sp spoken and superintending that causes everything to continue to exist. We don't exist in our own right. We are God's spoken word. God speaks, and we are here. God spoke, and the heavens and earth came into existence. God continues to speak, and so we continue to be. We are utterly and completely dependent every second, every moment of every day on God's kindness. So Jesus is the one in whom all things cohere. Jesus is the arche. Jesus is the point of integration. Everything holds together because of him. What we call natural law is simply God being kind to us. Most of the time, the car keys are right where we left them yesterday. Uh, most of the time. But the universe does not have an autonomous or independent existence apart from God. In him, we live and move and have our being, as it says in Acts 17, 28. But then there's one last thing that I want to leave you with. I want to talk about why God is pleased with you. 
We are evangelical and Calvinistic enough to know that everything I'm about to say is all of grace and nothing but grace. This is all of grace is because of Christ and nothing but Christ. We have not earned or deserved anything on our own. But because of Christ and through Christ and in Christ, what does God think of you? Through Christ, because of Christ, on account of Christ, what does God think of you? You have fled to Christ for mercy. And what is God's disposition toward those who do this? When, you've, when you come to God for mercy, what, is, what does God think of that? This psalm is a chiasm. And the central point of the chiasm, the hinge of the chiasm, is this. God does not take pleasure in man in his mounted military might or in his marching military might, but the, that he does take pleasure in those who come to him for mercy. That's what it says in verse 11. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Now, when you come to him for mercy, what are you doing? You're coming to him because you screwed up. You, you come to him because you sinned. You come to him for mercy because you don't deserve it. If you were asking for what you deserved, you would be asking for justice, not for mercy. When you ask for mercy, you are asking for God to be kind to you despite your sinfulness, despite the fact that you messed it all up. That's what you're asking for. Now, I want you to think about this. God takes pleasure in them that fear him, in those, he takes pleasure in those that hope in his mercy. When you get on your knees and you confess your sin at the beginning of this worship service, every week we do the same thing, we kneel and we confess our sins. God looks on that moment with pleasure. God looks on that moment with pleasure. He delights to receive confession of sin. He delights in it. In Luke 15, there are the three uh, stories, the, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. Lost, lost sheep, lost coin, and the lost son. In verse 7 in Luke 15, it says there's more rejoicing in heaven in the presence of God over one sinner who repents than over 99 who didn't stray. In the presence of God. What does that mean? It means the angels are having a party. When, when a sinner repents, there's a celebration in heaven. There's a, there's a party. Someone throws a party. When the prodigal son returned, the prodigal son is a glorious story. And uh, the prodigal son takes his inheritance and he goes off to a far country and he squanders it all in riotous living. He's buying drinks for the house and his brother accused him of spending it on prostitutes. And he was just blew it all. He blew everything. And that prodigal son finally comes to his senses and he comes back home. I think perhaps we really ought to call it the, the parable of the running father. The father looks down the road. The father sees him coming from a distance. And the father runs to greet him and calls for the fatted calf to be killed. And, and he calls for a, a robe to be put on him. And he hires a swing band. And, they, and they're playing music and they're dancing in the house. And the older brother comes in from the field, working in the field. And he hears the music and he hears the dancing and he says, what's going on? And someone tells him, your, your brother has returned, and your father has killed the fatted calf, and he is angry. He is angry. Now, think for a minute. Do, you, do we honestly believe that that boy, coming back from a far country, having spent everything on riotous living, that what he needed was another party? Is that what you would have given him? <laughs> would, would, you, would you have run down the road in order to get him another party? No, you want to be morally serious like the older brother. The older brother comes in and says, that's not appropriate. This is just plain not appropriate. I can't believe it. Now, think, think for a minute. He said, you, Father, you've never given me so much as a goat to celebrate with my friends. Now, first, this illustrates the older brother was a profound ingrate. Why? Because the parable begins with the father dividing the inheritance between the two. Both of them got their inheritance. You've never given me so much as a goat. And he had given him as much as he'd given, perhaps even more since he was the older brother. He, he, he had the inheritance apportioned to him. So he's profoundly ungrateful, profoundly ungrateful. And that indicates that the older brother had departed for a far country in his heart a long time before. He, he was gone. 
He was on the premises, but he was gone. At least the younger brother was honest about his departure as opposed to being dishonest about his departure. And then, returning to the dialogue, the older brother says, you never gave me so much as a goat to celebrate with my friends. And the father said, son, you don't have any friends. <laughs> that's, in the, that's in the Greek, right? <laughs> so you don't, you don't have any friends. You, you are so wound tight, you have a, you have a real problem. And the problem is that you don't understand the grace of God. What is the grace of God? God saves sinners. That's the message of this book. God saves sinners. God saves screw-ups. God saves them when they humble themselves and kneel in confession again. Right? They did it again, and they kneel in confession. What does God do? He receives it with pleasure. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. So, you come to him for mercy because you sinned, and God still takes pleasure in receiving you. You come to him because you sinned again, and he still takes pleasure in receiving you. Through the cross, God can take pleasure in sinners coming to him, and that would not be possible otherwise. You look to him as a God-fearing woman, as a God-fearing man, or as a God-fearing girl or boy, and what is God's response? Because of Christ, he takes pleasure in it. You delight him when you talk about your sin. You have to fear him. You have to come before him in the name of Christ. You can't come in your own merit. You can't come in your own strength. But when you, when you meet the terms of the covenant, God has made provision for you to come, and he's made provision for you to come in such a way as he can delight to receive you as the father delighted to receive his prodigal back. So God is kind to us. He makes provision for us. He delights to receive us. And when we come to him, according, think of it this way. You might think, you might technically check the box if I said, does God love you? Yeah, yeah, God loves me because you think he's perfect and that means he's got to. You know, he's got to love me because technically that's a theological trait. So God, yes, God, God loves me. Okay, does he like you? Well, that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other issue. Of course he doesn't like me. He, no. But look at this word. Verse 11. God delights. God takes pleasure. You come, he lights up. You come, he wants to receive you. He wants to, he wants to have that transaction of cleansing and forgiveness with you, which he does through Christ. Christ is the one who made that disposition toward you even a possibility. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that as we think about these things, uh, we can be strengthened and nourished and encouraged. I pray that you would help us to understand how, we're, how we are supposed to come to you uh, in true contrition and at the same time knowing that you are going to receive us according to your word. Father, we would lift up to you now the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Psalm 147 says that the Lord builds up Jerusalem and this table agrees. As we go about our work on the walls, this table reminds us that it is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. In making this point, it would be easy to think that the message is you need to take a break from your productive work on the walls to be refreshed at this table. There is certainly truth in that, but it doesn't get to the central thing. The heart of the matter is that coming to worship the Lord and renew covenant with him at this table is the most productive thing you can do for the kingdom of God. It was when Samuel offered up a sacrifice and looked to the heavens that the Lord thundered against the Philistines. It was when Paul and Silas prayed and sang that the earthquake came and their chains fell off. It was at an altar and through sacrifice and prayer that Elijah saw the fire of the Lord fall from heaven. We would like to think that our victories are ultimately attributed to our know-how and our hard work. And yes, yes, of course, the Lord helped us at certain points. But our victories are far more like the king of Israel's victories over the Syrians because God kept telling him through Elijah where the Syrian army had moved their forces. Imagine the interview after the battle. Do tell us, sir, how in the world did you do it? Well, God told me where they were hiding so it is with us. How did you come to be forgiven? How did you come to have life, joy, peace, and walk under the heavy blessing of God? 
It is quite simple. It is all of grace. Christ died for us. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you have given us your son as the cornerstone of your kingdom. We thank you for life and salvation in him. We thank you for his body broken for us and his blood shed for our sin. Please strengthen us now, for we come to this table in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. Here's the charge. The first thing to note is as, as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, because what I'm saying is based on the word, I have the authority to tell you this. And that is when you are coming to God to confess your sin, and you're confessing the sins of your youth, he receives you with pleasure. You say, but if, uh, if other Christians knew what I've tempted to do in my head, they would reject me. Yes, but God won't. He will receive you with pleasure. If you say it's, it, was really, it was a really big sin, he receives you with pleasure. The Apostle Paul was a blasphemer, a murderer. He took the life of Christians, and God selected him to write the majority of the New Testament. So you, you can't say I'm too big a sinner or it's too deeply ingrained or it's too tawdry. There's no excuses work, none of, none of them. He will receive you if you come in the name of Christ with pleasure. And so with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon and remain with you always. Amen.